Lord, help me to bring this all together, Father. In Jesus' name. There's so much confirmation that happened today. It is mind-blowing. You can't even begin to just... Um, I want to tell you, I had a dream last night. I don't dream much. I had a dream last night, and um, it's kind of... Um, um, wasn't really crazy or anything like that. I, I know it was for the Lord, from the Lord because it was a confirmation. This is what the dream was, really quick. Um, I had a dream that I was, uh, we was at a church, and um, and there was, uh, I, I wasn't the pastor at this church, um, but I was there, and um, it was outside, and man, they just had a bunch of people coming, a bunch of new people coming to the church. And um, so the minister that was there, um, he wasn't ministering, and he got nervous. And he's, you know, I said, you know, I said, what's going on? Because he was nervous. And I was sitting down, and I got up, and there was, man, all kind of people come in. And the people that were coming, they were bringing all kind of stuff. They had bicycles. They were little, like, to give. Bicycles, and they was carrying stuff. Like they was, it was going to go to something, right? Whatever they were bringing. And uh, the minister that was there, you know, I was like, wow, look at all the new people coming. And um, he got nervous. He, he didn't know what to do. And, you know, um... You know, I looked at him, and I'm like, you know, do you want me to minister? You know, because he's like tripping, you know. And I said, man, there's all kind of new people here. And he said, man, I said, he said, how many you think? I said, there's at least 50. There's 50 that I know. You know, that was a number that I gave in a dream. And he said, he said, yeah, you, I want you to minister. You minister. But, but, um, but don't, you know, don't get into that other, that, that old, that old stuff. Don't talk about that stuff that you used to say, that you used to talk about. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, just don't talk about that kind of stuff. And, um, so, I don't know what happened, but I turned, and I was, as I was walking, like, to come around, I was going to go to the front. You know, uh, outside, I was coming around like all the chairs that was outside. And as I turned and began to just walk around the front like that, um, they had this guy up there that stepped up and started ministering. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh my God. You know, they, that, this is not good. And this guy that was up there was talking about the same old, same old. Same old, same old. Church as usual. And I began to watch all the people as he began to talk and preach. He was preaching about the same thing and I watched all the people start getting up and leaving. They started getting up and walking away because there was no power in the message. It was, and this is what the, the deal was. It was like, we've heard this before. You know, there's nothing here for us. This is exactly what I was experiencing in the dream. And all I could do was look at the, that preacher because in a dream, the preacher was, the minister was worried about what I would speak about. And he panicked and got somebody familiar. And the people just, as he began to minister, began to get up and walk away. And I woke up. That was my dream last night. It was kind of... Um, but it all fits into what I'm going to tell you. Um, if you was here Wednesday, um, man, and I, I can't keep reiterating it. We have a good crew that comes. But if you're not here Wednesday, you're missing out in a big way. Because you're going to see tonight, for those who are here today, for those who are here Wednesday, how some amazing things tie in. Um, and I, I'm talking like just, you're going to be wild. Um, excuse me. I told you guys that I wanted to talk to you Wednesday night. I wanted to share something that had happened to us these past two weeks, my brother and I. Um, some things we've been experiencing. Because um, it's going to... I know you guys are going through things right now, beyond a shadow of a doubt. We all are. 
You're going to get your answer today. You're going to, get your answer. You're going to be encouraged today. You're going to be edified today. Um, it's pretty amazing because I haven't seen Tiffany in a while. And when I came here Wednesday, I heard she was here last week. I had to work. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have to work on Saturdays anymore, guys. You know, right now, I, I got a job. <laughs> right? Because I hate to be away from this place. I think in uh, maybe the five and a half years that we've been open, I might have not been here maybe four times. I had to get a couple of people to... I know uh, Charlene's ministered for me a few times. Maybe a little couple more times than that. Charlene's ministered a few times. My brother-in-law one time and... You know, uh, just a, at my pastor, Alan, he had come and ministered. But anyway, um, but I came in and, um, and that, not the, the Wednesday prior to this Wednesday, I told you guys we was getting into the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle and, you know, the foundation and the key to understanding everything. If you don't have, if you don't know this, the Tabernacle, it is the key to understanding and unlocking the mysteries of God. It's the power of God you're going to see. Um, and this is the first time in 17 years that I'm going through the book. At least trying to. And it's, you know, if you don't have the book, I encourage you to get it. It's the Tabernacle of Moses by Kevin Connor. Um, we're on page 20, 19 to 20. Um, we're going through it. But I'm having to fill in a lot, you know, in between. So there's a lot more that's coming. So you guys will understand. And the week before last, this all began 17 years ago for me, where God began to reveal the power of God and show me and reveal himself, and which resulted in what you see, the building of everything that's here. But... Not this Wednesday, but last Wednesday, I told you guys I was going to tell you how it all began, and it all began with three dreams, right? 17 years ago, and this past Wednesday, I didn't get to tell you last Wednesday, but I got to share with you this Wednesday, those three dreams. And then the fourth dream was the wristwatches and how God started the church. Um, I want to make a connection to what happened to that, because... The third dream, um, if you don't know about it, I have to tell you another time. Um, but the third dream was, uh, remember, you guys that were here, I told you that um, the man was on the pulpit, Dan, right? And up in the front, and there was a line, and he kept going, would you like to say something about the man of God? And um, would you like to say something about the man of God? I mean about Gabriel, I'm sorry, remember? And Gabriel means man of God, man of God. And I told you the man that was at the pulpit, this is very important, the man that came up to the first guy that was about, you know, you know, 13 or 14 of, of us up on a, on, a, on a platform, and he had, he had asked one, would you like to say something about Gabriel, about Gabriel, about Gabriel? And at the time I didn't know anything, but I said the man's name was Dan, remember? And I said, Dan means judgment, like Danny. Danny means judgment, and Daniel. Remember, God is my judge. And I've been telling you and showing you the importance of knowing the word, the meanings of the word, the colors, the numbers. This is where you begin to be able to interpret dreams, um, how God is speaking to you in various ways right in front of your face. I'm going to show you something that is so amazing, what happened this morning from Lukey, by walking in and giving me something which was mind-blowing. Um, but uh, so what happened and I told you about Wednesday you're going to see how it ties in to what happened the very next morning at 8.30 in the morning with me going to slide down and this man walks up to me and begins to speak to me um, so let me go back two weeks ago really quick because I'm going to give you a message today um, and I'm going to read something to you again from Gary Wilkerson I opened this up last night um, this is uh, June the 19th. This is my dad's birthday. My wife had put it in my room, gave it to me the uh, day before yesterday. I was going to sleep. I was about to fall asleep. I turned uh, my, the lights off, you know, in the camper. And, and actually my son came in and turned the lights off. And I put my head down. And the Lord spoke a word to me as I was falling asleep. And this is what he spoke to me. 
the evidence is overwhelming it overwhelms them and and I said it and I didn't want to get up but I knew if I didn't get up and write it down I was gonna forget it right the evidence is overwhelming it overwhelms them I got up turned the lights on wrote it down on the paper then opened up Gary Wilkerson's letter and read the letter and I was blow just boom you remember I told you guys Wednesday night in the dreams the first dream and there was a man behind me that said let them choose first the jewels remember the voice behind me the voice behind me and I said there was a lady at Citadel that even gave me a plaque the voice behind you remember this stuff amazing stuff watch so let me tie some things in um, because this is what I believe the Lord is speaking and showing um, just to let you know we I haven't given up uh, I usually tell people we're gonna we're gonna go through this and I'm gonna read the whole book and you know and then God's got another plan or whatever it is but you know last week we was with Elijah and Elisha right Elijah and the whole deal is showing Jesus Christ and him crucified and the power of the Word of God through the evidence that's overwhelming right I'm going to show the importance the importance of that of that evidence two weeks ago my brother and I um, God had spoken a, a word to my brother gave him and eventually he's going to be able to give it right um, but uh, God spoke a word to him and very uh, awesome word very and, and listen if I'm telling you it's good it's good right it, it, it's uh, it, all of God's words good but it's really the way he put it together it's for uh, it's for a body of believers it's not for someone who's not a believer or trying to come to be a believer um, it's for you and me so when he began to share it with me I was like wow so here you go two weeks ago um, my brother and I is, uh, besides Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday and Saturday, four days a week, that we in church, right? I was tired last night. I had a poor slab in the evening time. That's why I wasn't here, guys, last night. Um, lady down the street come and got me and asked me to pour a foundation, form something up and pour it. She had some people coming today. What's that? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Get a foundation. Remember everything I told you guys about. This is the foundation right here. Not, the, not Kevin Connor's book, The Word of God, but the building on that foundation, which is really important because it came and it was manifested in Brother Sal's Word. And I even, I wrote it down because the word that was spoken, that he had spoke, and I know it's a lot of information, but um, from the beginning of the praise and worship and what was in the song to, and I know I'm all over, but I'm going to tie all in the, these ends in. Um, uh, you know where is your treasure what do you seek I've given you my spirit I've given you all things have I not given you my spirit my power my authority my word where is your treasure right my brother told me today the very I mean we're sitting up here and we're talking before you guys are here and he says to me you know brother it's about really seek ye first the kingdom of God it's about seeking him first and we're going to tie all of this in in a minute um, but um, it's amazing how God begins to confirm things over and over so what is your treasure what do you seek I've given you my spirit I've given you all things now why that's important is because when I get into Gary Wilkerson's letter you're gonna see because it's for us and for the church so here we go two weeks ago we are going to the prison and minister first time in five years I've ever experienced this in prison since I've been going um, they brought a zone out to us in the dining area and um, just like you know uh, usual you know me and my brothers in there and all these guys walk in the first one that walks in it was different this time because when they came in to physically look at them they looked like they were absolutely crazy and when I say crazy, I'm talking about psycho ward crazy. They had that wide-eyed stare, 
in five years, we've never experienced what we experienced. I even called up and see if Brother Sal wanted to come, but he was busy. I'm so glad <laughs> because you talk about a crazy one, right? So anyway, um, so we go in and the first guy, you know, they all come in. There was about 10 of them or whatever it was. And man, I, I just kind of look at my brother and I'm looking at these guys and the, what they carried in there was death. Was death. Let me tell you something. You always got to be on guard when you're in prison. Always. When you're ministering in prison. And especially coming from that background, being a jailer, being an, a, a police officer, you know, for a while and stuff. Um, I'm always on guard. Always. Um, I know how to deal with them. I know how to handle them. But that's why it's good that we go together. Two people. You know, you never go alone. But anyway, when they came in there, it was different. This guy walks in, and he walks in, and I got the little sign-in thing. I said, hey, man, how you doing? And I said, you know, what zone y'all from? What, what zone is this? Is this the federal? He said, no, we are the, um, we're the violent offenders, and I'm in here for murder. And I mean, and let me tell you something. He's looking at me in my eyes, crazy. They came in. So in this zone at the end, they put all the violent offenders together. Because, because that's exactly what they are. They're violent offenders. They're in there for serious stuff. Serious stuff. There's another guy in there. They all come in there and they, they, uh, they sign in and stuff like that. And one guy uh, in particular sitting on the end of the table, this guy that told me he was in there for murder, is sitting right next to him. They psycho crazy. Crazy. I mean, and I wound up knowing one of them. But they've never... You know, first time that we've been there with them. And um, this one guy on the end of the table, I was like on super on guard because I knew something was going to go down. I knew it. I didn't know if it was going to be spiritual or physical, but something was going to happen in that, in that zone. Well, God had given Jason a message. So I said, brother, you know, I'm going to let you minister tonight. You know? So we went there. And when we got there... And these guys walked in instantly. I knew I need to handle it tonight. I need a minister. Because it wasn't right. It, you know, they were crazy. The message that he had was a message for those who are saved and just hungry. But I didn't say anything. And, you know, Jason went into worship. And I come and walked on side of him. And, and uh, sat, you know, sat next to him as he was playing. And as he was playing, you know, a couple of songs, he looked and he said, man, he, under his breath, he said, it's, it's thick, huh? And I'm like, man, I can't even explain it to you how thick it was in there. In there. Um, so, what's that? I thought, I thought I was going to get snuck when I was playing. That was, that was the whole thing. That's how bad it was. I knew something was going to go down, but you had to keep your eyes open because at any minute, I was expecting something to happen. So anyway, we tried to, you know, uh, go through, uh, break through through songs, and we couldn't. Now, a couple of them did where you can see two of them in there. They actually, one come and Jason said, come sit next to me. You know, and this guy come and sat. Then another one came and sat. So God was definitely moving right there in it. So... After he said, uh, he played a couple of songs where it was, he says, look, let me just tell you this. You know, and he, he put the guitar down, and here we go. The very one that told me he was in there for murder just leaps at him. Now, when I say not physically, spiritually. And, no, because, yeah, so watch. And let me tell you something, it was serious business. Because what happens is, when he, when Jason began to speak... He said, oh, so like you believe that Jesus is God. You believe in a trinity. And Jason's like, yeah. Well, he opens his Bible up and he says, here it is right here. He's not God. He's the son of God. And so Jason says, well, no, he's God. And he says, look, let me just kind of show you. So he took him to Noah's Ark where there's three in one. And he stops him. He said, ah, 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 hold up a second. I didn't ask nothing about Noah's Ark. You said that Jesus is God. Prove it to me. 
show me. Now you got to realize, this has got all the attention of all the men in his zone. And now he's walking in authority. Because, now, number one, he's not letting him give an explanation, right? Number two, he's questioning him in a word, and all the guys are looking not only at him and him, and Jason begins to talk to him and try to show him something, and he's like, uh-uh, I want you to show me. Well, he was. But what, and you know what, and then, you know, uh, I said, hold up a second. You know, Jason walked to the table, get some water, and um, I'm like, you know what, hold on a second. I said, let me take this, I'm going I'm to handle it. He, he walked up to me, he walked up to the table to get a swallow of water because it was serious. It was a serious encounter. And he walked up to the table. And when he walked up to the table to grab the water, while I was sitting down, he was lifting the water up and he said, can you handle this? Under his breath. So he put the water down and that's when I said, hold up a second, brother. I said, uh, I said you said that Jesus is not God. So I said, I want you to open your Bible up to uh, John chapter 17, verse 20. Where Philip asked, right? Philip said, you know, show us the Father. And he said, how long have I been with you so long that you don't recognize me? That me and the Father are one. When I told him that, all he can do was sit there and stare in his Bible. And that was it. Boom. And when I, what happened was, you see... The way he was taught or what he believed, he was stumped by something that was in front of him that he couldn't explain. And I, I could have took him to, you know, John chapter 10 and showed him where it says, you know, that he's literally or uh, where he's literally, me and the Father are one, he says it. And also in verse in first John chapter 5, where there are three that bear witness in heaven, and these three are one, one, Trinity. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. And these three, Spirit, the Word, and the Father, agree as one. So we have to have the witness of the three, of the three that's heaven, here on earth. Repent and be baptized for remission of sin, right? And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I said, hey, I said, um, let me ask you a question. After I gave him that. I said, Who, what are you? What are you made up of? I'm Nikki. I said, no, you're spirit, soul, and body. You're three in one right so everything began to change but from that point it was all over with it got so pumped up and the guys just like focused in on because like I said the evidence so then after I spoke that to him I brought him back to where Jason took him I said now I'm gonna prove to you that Jesus is God so I took him to Noah's Ark and started just running through God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one. The Trinity, the triune God. Even where it says that the Godhead, Paul said, is a mystery. But they're three in one and they can separate themselves. Right? We're bound by the flesh, but when we die, our spirit goes back to the Father. But our soul, that battle between the, the flesh and the spirit depends on where our soul, three in one. In the beginning, we was created spirit, soul, and body. Now we're body, soul, and spirit because of sin. The spirit's supposed to rule, right? Now the body, because of the fall, the body took over. I want this, I want that. So the question was, you believe Jesus is God? Listen to this. Oh, you believe in a trinity. Attack. So then, um, Wednesday night, we have, this past Wednesday night, God took authority in there, and the evidence was overwhelming. came great right after that. That, that's it. It, it, it. Because the power of the word was so strong that, number one, it answered the question. And you know when I, I told, when we went in there, first thing I told all those guys when they were sitting down, I said, listen, if you got any question about anything in the word, I don't care what it is. I say this every time I go. I don't care whatever it is that you got in the word. Any question you got, any discrepancy that you might think is in the Word, ask me, please. That's what I say. Because I want to deal with whatever might be a wall that's separating them from God. So, Wednesday night, we come here. We have service. And what I did was, I brought you back 
of how everything got started 17 years ago for me when God began to reveal to me His Word through the tabernacle of Moses but it started out with reading His Word and studying His Word and God began to lead me and show me to the dream and all of this kind of stuff. Three dreams, three nights in a row in April of 1999. So that's Wednesday and I told you guys what went down, right? In the dreams and all this stuff. Thursday morning, 8.30 in the morning, I get up. Check this out, Nikki. Oh, here's a Nikki, right? That's a Nikki right here. Um, so me and the wife goes to Lowe's because I'm gonna work on the countertops. You know, I'm finishing the countertops and everything in, uh, in the house. So I go to Lowe's and we're looking for the, the stain that we're going to stain it, you know, and uh, uh, acid stain it and then seal it. And I was looking for a sponge and this guy walked up to me and he says, hey, he says, uh, can I help you? He worked at Lowe's. I said, I said, yeah, I don't know where the sponge is at. And I'm looking at him like, I know this guy. He looks very familiar, right? Really soft spoken. You know, he's not threatening in any kind of way or anything like that. So he said, yeah, come on, so it's on, on a, the uh, aisle next to us. We walked down the aisle, and um, I said, man, do I know you? Did you work at Home Depot in Picayune? Are you from Picayune? He says, yeah, I'm from Picayune. I didn't work at Home Depot. I said, maybe I remember you from Resurrection Life or something. He said, yeah, well, I went there for a while. And um, I said, well, I, I was a minister there for a while. And, you know, I taught life groups and all this stuff. And he says, well, my brother was a minister there. I said, really? I said, who's your brother? He said, Danny. Right? I'm like, Danny, oh, wow. I said, man, I know Danny really well. He says, you do? I said, you probably know my daughter-in-law, Nikki. And he said, Nikki? I said, yeah, Nikki with the children? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know Nikki. I said, married my son, Josh. I said, man, I, I know your brother good. And he says, well, um, I'm Muslim. I'm, I'm like, really? He said, yeah. He said, uh, can I ask you a question? Now watch this. He, after he told me he was Muslim, I said, really? I said, you know, wow. You know, and uh, so he was looking down the aisle and he, I guess he was, he turned around, he started walking off and he, he walked, I don't know, maybe hit the wall over there and I'm looking at the sponges and he came and walked back to me. Now I'm nailed down looking on, a, on the ground, kneeling down. The sponges were low and he walked up to me and he said he walked up to me and says can I ask you a question I said yeah he said I'm gonna ask you the same question that I asked Dan brother Dan at resurrection life Wednesday night Dan remember Dan I said Dan Danny, Danny's his brother, now he's presenting this whole thing, Dan, Danny, Daniel, God is my judge. I just told everybody last night about the dreams and how the dreams represent, what they represented, it's power through his word that we get, right, and all of this stuff. And here it is, he walks up to me and says, Dan and Danny. I'm like, and I'm looking at him. He says, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. As soon as he said that, my wife walks up. It, it's, I mean, she walks up right when he says, can I ask you a question? She walks up. This is his question. Do you believe Jesus is God? Do you believe in a trinity? The very, very question that was presented Thursday before. He said, do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe in a trinity? And can you prove it to me? Just watch he says. I, I'm, and he says, can you prove it to me? Because I asked Brother Dan the same question and he couldn't prove it to me. He said, and it's true, it requires faith. This is nothing against Brother Dan. Brother Dan is a mighty, mighty man of God in the Word. But he said, let me tell you something. Because he couldn't answer the question, I'm a Muslim today. That's what he told me. Now I know there's more to it. 
But he said, you can't even prove to me Jesus is God. My wife is standing right there with her jaw dropped. <laughs> because she knows what happened Thursday. And I'm like, I cannot believe this is happening. I said, Chris. I, I, I stood up. I said, Chris, man. And he's looking down the aisle. I said, I can definitely prove to you that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is God. And I can prove to you the Godhead, the Trinity. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. I said, baby, give me my card. With my phone number on it. I said, Chris, take this card. My phone number's on it. When you get off work this week and you got off some time, call me up. Because I want to sit down with you. Whether it's at my house or your house or somewhere we can sit down. But I want to prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is God. And he says, oh, maybe you can come to the mosque. And I said, well, I said, let's talk together first. We'll get together and we'll talk. I said, I've read the Quran, And Jesus to you is Issa. And I know what your imam is, right? And I know what the Quran is made up of. And he says, okay, I'm going to call you. And I left. Thursday, prison again. Here it is. This, this Thursday. Um, so, I talked to you guys Wednesday night. Thursday morning that happened, 8.30 with Chris. Thursday, we're going back to the prison. I'm going to let Jason minister. So, we get in there. We go back to a zone that... A5 that we said we was going to come back to. We ministered to him two weeks ago. We told him we was going to come back the following week, but we wound up having to go to A3. So we left message with the with the, uh, the the deputy to go tell him that we'll be back the following week, even though we're not scheduled, because they wanted us to come back. So here it is. We go there. All the guys come in. This guy walks in. There's only three out of the zone, out of about ten. Uh, there was ten guys that came in. Three was only the same from the last time we administered. Three guys that was the same. And when this guy walks in, he says, Man, I've been telling these guys about, man, what you were sharing and what you were showing and, and all of this stuff. I've been telling them in the zone. And um, so there's like seven different guys there. And one of the guys' name's House. He's wearing glasses. I'm thinking, do they call you House because of the TV program or whatever it is? You know, is And... Um, so Jason's going to minister. But, but even before he picks a guitar, uh, well, he's got the guitar in his hand, he's about to play and start playing, this guy begins to introduce this new guy, House, and that, man, he's coming around. He said, you know, um, but, and this guy, he's got his left arm, he's tattooed all up, the seven deadly sins, are all tattooed, lost envy, you know, everything is just all over him. And um, right out the door, you know, so you believe in Jesus? In the Trinity? Right? But the way he does it is in the, in the, in the sense of, well, I don't believe all the Bible, and I don't believe that that's the only way or whatever it is. He said, but, um, you know, and I, now I don't have the floor. Jason does. But he's kind of talking to kind of like both of us, but Jason's supposed to minister, but he really ain't got to say anything yet. This dude starts quoting, like, you know, Galileo and, and uh, uh, um, uh, Socrates and Mayan text and Samaritan. He starts going off and starts talking about the rivers and the giants and man he just and he says and the Bible is full of discrepancies I said hold up a second and you know I said let's start where you started in the beginning you know he says you can't even explain to me who Cain married I'm like Erp. hold on a second Bubba we're gonna put the brakes on and um, so now and this guy, he's like all over the place, you know. Another guy's walking, like coming, trying to sit around the backside of Jason. And, and, and Jason's like, hey, man, y'all need to get up here, you know. So I wind up, you know, um, answering his questions. But it got, 
it got crazy up in there as far as the power of the word came. The jailer came to the door because of, I was pumped, right? Because the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit overtook it and put him in his place. And even at the end of it, I told him, explain the Quran, and at the end of it, you know, um, I said, you know what, brother, you know, you probably know more than me. And he's like, no. And I did it on purpose. He said, no, I don't know more than you for sure. You definitely know a whole lot more than me. I said, today, tonight, tonight, I presented you the gospel of Jesus Christ beyond the shadow of a doubt to show that Jesus Christ is who he says he is for two hours, maybe a little more, huh? Over two hours going just, and it was so powerful. They had guys in there that were crying. A couple of them that were just out there. I mean, it was it, just craziness. Three of them just, zone, just, and after the presentation of the gospel and the truth of God's word presented to him, as I'm talking to him, he sees in the library, he sees the Quran on a shelf. He went and picked the Quran up and he sat down and he's got it in front of him. This is when I'm just getting started because he went and picked the Quran up. He's about 50 feet away from it. Yeah, I, don't even, I have no idea how he spotted the Quran in a library on a shelf covered in books. Have no idea. No lie. This, he was where Jason was. About this, this is how far we was apart. And he picked the Quran up about right here. This is where it was. He's on a bookshelf. So anyway, so anyway, after the presentation of the gospel and salvation delivered like they have never heard it before in their entire life, he's walking out the door with the Quran. I said, you're not supposed to take that. But yeah, I, I'm going to try it anyway. I said, I just presented life to you. Salvation beyond the shadow of a doubt. And you're going to walk out of here with a Quran? with the Quran, come on, right? But man, just gone. So, what I wanted to share with you today, I guess I'm going to sum it up in a minute, but I want to read something to you, because, and I want you to remember this, the evidence is overwhelming. I had Luke walk into me today, Luke, Luke Lukey, John and, and Cheryl's son. God is so absolutely amazing. Luke, he walks in, he's starting to cough. Oh, there he is right there. And you know what? This is the second time Luke's walked in with confirmation. Luke, first time he walked in and gave me a cross with a quarter. And I was just starting with the ministry of the Holy Spirit and with the lampstand. Watch how crazy amazing this is. Um, it starts in Exodus chapter 25 when he walks in and gives me the cross and a quarter where the lampstand is actually described in the word. This time he walks in, he's carving, and he hands me a sword. And you know what? It's amazing because, man, what God puts on in kids' heart, in people's heart, it might not make sense at first, but man. So, I want to read this to you, and this is going to explain it. You guys ready? Watch this. After the Lord telling me, um, woke me up, well, I was about to go to sleep, about 10, 10.30 last night, the evidence is overwhelming. Um, it overwhelms them. The evidence is overwhelming. It overwhelms them when they hear it presented in a way that they've never heard it before. That's why I had a dream that last night God gave me a dream the guy didn't want me to present it. But because it was the same repetition of what people hear in general, is the very same thing that Chris and Lowe said. Because he couldn't answer a question or go into power and the authority of the word, I'm Islamic now. People are walking away from the church today because there's no power and authority. There's no sword. No word. 
How crazy is this? That he comes in. And my brother asked me. He said, brother, can you take this? Because, you know, there's only one thing in the Word of God. There's only one thing that's quick and powerful. It's the Word of God. Miracles are not quick and powerful. Healings are not quick and powerful. God said, my Word is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing of the joints in a marrow. And as a discerner of the heart, their thoughts. And that's what happened in that zone, in that prison. And those guys said, we have never heard anything like this before because the overwhelming authority and power of the Word of God, it overwhelms them. And they stand there, sit there in awe by it. It's only by the Word that does that. Nobody else could have... I've been encountered by it now four times. Three... Well, it's been more than that, but three times in two weeks about how powerful we really need to have the Word of God in us. The Bible says that we need to be able to give someone an answer. Because Jesus dying on the cross is just not good enough for some of them. And because they don't, the church is not giving them the answer, they're leaving. They're walking out and leaving. That's what that dream was about. Because there was no power and authority in the church. Meaning no word. Tired of hearing the same stuff over and over again. This is what these men in prison said. They say it all the time. But there's like, wow. We've never, could you please? We've never heard anything like this before. Could you please come back? Brother Clarence, who's over the jail, these people request that we come back. They want us to come back. And when they talk about the other ones, it's the same old, same old. They're not interested. But you know what they say? They want the jailers to tell them, let us know when the two brothers are coming back with the guitar. And Pete. Because we'll go. And in that power carries them back to the cell zone. The evidence is overwhelming whether they accept it or reject it. And let me tell you something. The very sword itself was swung all kind of ways and they walked away from him, Jesus. And that's why I said, now those who have ears, let them hear because not everybody has an ear to hear. So no matter how powerful it is, some will hear and some will walk away. And we was talking about that right here this morning. And it's a discerner of the heart. Why does one grow and the other one who's been coming doesn't? Because the Spirit knows your heart. Let me read. This is called releasing the overcoming power of the Holy Spirit and it's called thank you Luke the sword of the Spirit Luke I want to tell you something Luke it's by no coincidence it's, I say it's, it's by no chance that you wanted to pick this up and start carving that God literally and physically God the Father by His Spirit spoke to you the Spirit of the Lord spoke to you Luke and you heard Him that means that you have an ear to hear. And you did what it was that God told you. And you called this out and God told you to give it to me. Because this sword right here was a confirmation to what God is ministering today. Do you realize that you are part of the message? That not only am I up here ministering, but you have actually become part of the testimony and ministry that's what I'm speaking right now. You know what that means, Luke? 
God is going to use you in a big way. You know why? Because you hear Him and you obey Him. Amen. You heard Him. He loves you. That's amazing stuff. So thank you for being obedient and doing what it was that God told you to do. That's awesome stuff, Luke. Thank you. Lukey Luke, man. It's two times God used him. Releasing the overcoming power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, this was by David Wilkerson. This is Gary's letter. This is dated June the 19th. This is his letter that just came out. I just opened it up last night at 10.30. Listen to this. Let me tell you about two men I knew. Both are converted drug addicts and alcoholics, and at one time they led horrible lives. Both are married with children, and while they were addicted, they had problems with lust, pornography, adultery. They were, on, uh, they were con artists, trying to fool their wives and families about everything, hustling and conning their way through life. But both men came to Times Square Church and gave their lives to Jesus. They wept as they confessed their many sins and testified they were born again. Moreover, each man was willing to leave everything behind and enter our ministries and enter our ministry's Christ-centered drug rehabilita rehabilitation program for nine months. Um, neither of these men had any past knowledge of the Lord. But as soon as they entered our program, one of them seemed to make great progress immediately. He was very cooperative and uh, compliant with all the programs and rules. And this man wrote, uh, wore a, a smile continually. During chapel services, he eagerly entered into worship. As I watched him during the period, I couldn't help thinking, this one is becoming a true man of God. He is passing up the other fellow by leaps and bounds. Indeed, I was concerned about the other man. He always seemed down and depressed. And he had a terrible time obeying the program's rules. He struggled continually with his new faith, never coming to a place of peace. He had, never, he had never smiled, appearing forever weighed down by the heavy conviction. He wept through every chapel service, never even lifting up his head. Yes, the Lord, the Lord saw something in this poor man, struggling uh, addict, that, uh, that I didn't see. Yes, the Lord. i got to slow down. Oh. Okay, Lord. Yet the Lord saw something in this poor struggling addict that I didn't see. He saw with him a heart set on following God. As it turned out, the man struggled so heavily because he was determined to give his all to the Lord. Yet he knew there was still a great deal in his heart that stood in the way. The reason he held his head down during worship was because the Holy Spirit was revealing the sin in his life. And he was so deeply convicted. He couldn't be happy because what he saw in himself burdened him down. And I'm going to tell you again, the answer to your question that you're carrying will be answered today. Struggling? Me too. But it's good. God's always on time. After that experience, I prayed, Lord, the changes you've worked in this struggling man are incredible. He has such power in his life. He's got victory over his habits. No more lust problems. No more craving for drugs. Your spirit has been released in him mightily. What did you see in him that qualified him for such a release of power to overcome sin? I have, I, I've had a deep burning hunger to know what it takes for the Holy Spirit to release his mighty power in our lives. If His promised power is not being released in us, what's hindering it? What does God want to see in us before such release can take place? I've come to believe, David Wilkerson says, there's three conditions, three conditions are necessary before the power of the Holy Spirit is released in any believer. We'll never see the power of God's Spirit released in our lives until we meet three qualifications. The first pre prerequisite is a heart set wholly upon the Lord. Holy. 
In Acts 8, we read of a man who qualified in all three of these prerequisites. He was an Ethiopian statesman who was returning home from a religious gathering in Jerusalem. When we first read about him, he's riding along in, Gaza, in the Gaza Desert in the back of a chariot. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under cadence of the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. This man was a rich man, right? And he had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. This is Acts 27, I mean Acts chapter 8, uh, verse 27 and 28. You can read about it. Apparently, this man was, devote, was a devoted student of God's Word. Although he was spiritually blinded, blind, he hungered deeply for truth. And now, as he read chapter 53 of the book Isaiah, he was desperate to know what the prophet was saying. This is a prerequisite. You need to have that hunger. And now, as he read chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah, he was desperate to know what the prophet was saying. I can say emphatically that this Ethiopian had a heart wholly given to God. How do we know? Man, he went to Jerusalem to worship, and now he's on his way back and he's reading the Word. Right? He doesn't know all things, but he's hungry for Him. How can I be sure of this? I know it because he was studying God's Word, searching, probing, seeking after the Lamb of Life. I ask you, what are you searching for in your walk with the Lord? Remember I told you it's all about Jesus. Seek ye first His kingdom. I ask you, what are you searching for in your walk with the Lord? Are you looking for some kind of experience? Are you seeking something a human can give you by laying hands on you? Wow. All to your neglect of God's Word in your life. How many people run around from revival to revival looking for a man to lay hands on him, give him a word, but don't go to the Word itself? Wow. Watch this. There can be no release of the Holy Ghost power in you until you develop a sincere desire for the milk and the meat of the Bible. Amen. You got to want it. If you don't want it, you ain't going to get it. And trying to get it another way, you ain't going to get it. You have to be, you have to be, you have to be hungry for God's Word as the Ethiopian statesman was. Amen. David wrote, Direct my steps by your word, O Lord. Psalms 119, 133. My heart stands in awe at your word. These men are overwhelmed all blown away by how amazing and how powerful the Word of God is. Because when that guy left there with all his knowledge he had of Socrates and all the junk and the Ethiopian and the Mayan texts and Samaritan and all of this stuff, he was still empty and void. Didn't have anything. Dead. But guess what? Life was presented to him and shown to him in a way that he was in awe. He says, you have magnified your word above your name. Wow, think about that one. 
You can't stand in awe of God's Word or have your steps ordered by Him unless you open your Bible. David Wilkerson. It takes... This one, this is one reason why so many Christians today are still bound by sin, unable to gain freedom, and they have very little knowledge and the power of God in their life. Do you know, it's, we are supposed to have this inside of us. So that we could set others free. Because let me tell you something. The days that we're living in now, the average of what set people free before is not going to cut it now. The dream was proof of it. God's Word is proof of it. What happened in the prison these two times and in the next day walk and have a man who said I'm not serving Jesus no more because he's not God number one and a Christian couldn't explain it to me and prove to me that he was God when we are supposed to be able to It's not blind faith anymore. We got the Word. And the Word has enough in it that we can prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus is who He says He is. Right? Remember what it said uh, on the thing? I'm glad. The evidence that I presented is overwhelming to them who don't know Him. We, whether they accept it or reject it, we still need to have the power of God in us. And let me tell you something. They recognize power and authority. Because if you don't believe me, ask them. They will tell you. They tell you who's fake, who's phony, and who really loves Jesus. You know why? Because they see it in you. Man. He says, In many churches, people merely endure the preaching of the Word. They don't want to hear strong doctrine. They prefer wonders, miracles, excitement, and speak only about the power of God. Listen. But what is the power of God? The Word. That's what he said. The Word of God is quick and powerful. But people run, David Wilkerson, in many churches, people merely endure the preaching of the Word. They're not hungry for it. They're enduring. You know what it means? They don't want it. They don't want to hear it. Show me a sign. Show me a wonder. Show me a miracle. Well, it's wicked. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh for a sign, but no sign shall be given them but the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the sign of Jonah. If you can't present Jesus Christ and Him crucified, you have no power. Because that's what it's all about. And let me tell you something, it takes more than one. Right? Remember Paul, even preaching to King Agrippa, King Agrippa, he, he says, I, surely I know you know, the, uh, you, you know the, the customs and my people. And I'm sure Paul laid it on him, son, and he said, you almost, you know, convinced me. That's what Paul preached, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You've got to realize, your life 
is about that. That's what you're here for. Your whole life is not about you. Your life is about proving to God a workman who needeth not to be ashamed. Wow. To who? Me? No. You are a representation of Jesus Christ in the earth. Jesus Christ was the Word. You need that Word in you because people's lives depend on it. And they're walking out of the church because it's not there. And I'll tell you another thing. They walk it out the church even when it's there. Because it says it. They don't want to hear strong doctrine. But guess what? You did what you were supposed to do. And you warned them. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, Christian, the most important thing is your tool, the Word. You need to know it. Not for you. We just struggle and try to be good and worrying about not sinning when we should be overcoming and stopping the enemy. Because the kingdom of heaven, which is you and me, suffered violence. We was attacked in the jail. But the violent and that sword ah! and you watch them oh, just the power of God just level them. Realize it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about your ability to be able to convict, convince. Now another spirit, through the power of the word, brings conviction. But the only way the power of the word can come forth, it's got to be in you. So that the spirit can just magnify it. Because the information highway that's out there now, the people that you're having to deal with now. Whatever they want to know, they just say it. What goo? What does this mean, Google? And they puke up garbage on you that's untrue, and they think they know what's truth. But you need to be able, through the Word of God, show them it's wrong. And don't tell me, don't tell me, child of God, that everybody's got that gift. Because everybody is supposed to have the Word of God in them. We need to know the Word. We don't know all things. But the more we put in us, the Spirit... You know, a quick question thrown out to you, you might, you know, can you, I ask you, can you prove to someone who is not saved that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords? That's your job. To present to someone the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. If you could show him that Jesus died and rose again, one time, great. Two times, great. If you could show it to him 15 times, the evidence is overwhelming. And you know what? There's a little something that's inside of him says, wow. Oh, wow. And you see it on him. Now whether they follow that wow or not, ain't up to us. One plants, one waters, God gives the increase. But our life, do you desire Jesus? Do you, de do you desire Him? Is He your life? Is He what you long for? His Word. Because this Holy, this, we've got to realize the Holy Spirit knows. And don't 
be, you know, surprised if one day you knock on the door and he tells you, I don't know you. Because your passion wasn't for him. Your passion was for the things in the world. That's why one excels out of the other. Two come in. One, yeah, they're both free. Yeah, one's struggling. But one will come in and has a passion so deep and so hungry for Jesus, all of a sudden, man, they just take off. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is a discerner of their heart and He just begins to pour it on them. Keep going. In many churches, people merely endure the preaching of the Word. They don't want to hear strong doctrine. They prefer wonders, miracles, excitement. Speak only about the power of God. I've been told here, oh, because you don't have a kids ministry, because you don't have a good praise and worship team, because you don't have this for us, and because you don't do that for us, and because you don't have, you know, uh, things that you got planned for the singles, and, and then we can't come here. What? What? Because I don't have all these things to offer? What do you offer? What are you offering? It sounds like you're coming to get. And believe me, we got enough getters. How can you come and be a part of the kingdom? Meaning build the word that was presented. You know, that, you know, uh, that was spoken... Um, where you treasure it. Where is your treasure? Look at this. Where is your treasure? A word came forth. Everybody's prayer. But this was a prophecy, a word that was coming forth. God was asking. Listen, I'm asking. This is the message. Wow. Where is your treasure? What do you seek? <laughs> That's what the Spirit of the Lord is speaking through it. Have not I given you my spirit? What do you really want? Because the, uh, the Spirit in the letter is the real discerner. And He knows if you're really discerning, if you're really wanting Him, if you really want Him, boom, you'll explode. But if you don't, you just sit there and say, uh, what do you have to offer in the kids' ministry? Because the church down the street has, well, you just need to go down to the, the church down the street because obviously you're not here to build the kingdom. You're here to get from the kingdom. And let me tell you something. There have been a lot of getters here. And all the money that's ever come in here that we've had extra and, and, and over, brother, let me, gave it all away, every bit of it, down to the last penny. Gave it away. Gave it. I don't have a banking account. We don't have, well, we have a bank account, but there ain't nothing in it. We go from we, month to month. That's what we do. And let me tell you something. If there was 50,000 in it, that 50,000 would be in something. It would be in people. Because God is interested in building people, not buildings. And guess what? Those that I said, I can't pay your bill no more. I can't do this for you. I can't pay, you know, to get you out of jail. And we can't do this and we can't do that. <laughs> They're gone. Yeah. Man. See, God knows the heart. Thank you, Lord. Watch this. He says, and I can assure... In many churches, people are, uh, merely endure the preaching of the Word. They don't want to hear strong doctrine. They prefer wonders, miracles, excitement, speak only about the power of God. Yet often, uh, yet, I mean, you often hear them saying things like, uh, at Reverend so-and-so's meeting, there was such power. You, re you don't hear that. We need that kind of power in our church. But they know nothing about the true power of God because they don't know the Scriptures. What? David Wilkerson, exclamation point, he put right there. Boom. Because they don't know the scriptures. Wow. Jesus said to the Sadducees, you do error in not knowing the scriptures. Because they thought neither, you know, who's they going to be, you know, in the kingdom? Marriage, they were neither married nor given in marriage. But you see, watch this. Is there marriage in heaven? No. You error. And not knowing the scriptures. They're thinking there's marriage in heaven. 
Well, it's pretty clear. When you go through the Word, the Word will explain to you what's there, you know, what's, what's true and what's not. And that's why they got all these misconceptions or they think that the Word, you know, has got all of these mistakes in it. But let me tell you something. When I begin to explain to this guy... And he starts telling me about how, oh, there was a second incursion, you know, and angels coming down and all of this stuff. I said, well, hold on a second. And listen to me. He quoted directly. Started telling me about the Amorites and the king of Bashan, Og, who had a, third, a bedstead of 13 foot, you know, two. And man, he's, ro he's rolling scriptures. Like word for word. Yeah, word for word. So he, it would appear that he had power and authority. But hold on a second. So now, so you're saying there's a second deal. Wrong. What do you mean, wrong? Well, go follow the Amorites, yeah, and who their, their grandfather was. It was Ham. Ham, his descendant, Cush. Ham, Cush, Nimrod, giant. Anyway, so, anyway. The author of Hebrews, uh, the author of Hebrews describes true power of God. He says it all rests in the Word of God. Does it rest in a miracle, a healing, a physical manifestation? No, it does not. Let me read it again. The author of Hebrews, who was Shaul, Paul, most likely, says, describes that the true power of God is the Word of God. It's the Word that's quick and powerful. That, is more, that should be the most important thing to you. Than what, look at this, what's going around today. The armor of God. I saw it in the front being handed out. People getting the armor. Man, all the other pieces, this is all defensive, except the sword. If you don't have the sword, that means if I went to the prison, this guy asks me this question, he bombards me or us with all of this garbage. Yeah, I got salvation. I got the breastplate. I got the sh my shoes are shod. I, you know, I got the shield of faith when he's fiery darts of the enemy. But what is good as an enemy? I mean, what good is an army without a weapon? So after he puked his garbage, wham! Because it's the word, the sword. You need it. Because now you divide what's true and what's not. And now others that are there are watching the power of God be manifested over this false teaching and doctrine that he's puking up on them in a cell. But because we're unlearned and we don't want to study ourselves and take the time to learn the scriptures, you have no sword. And any sword, basically, that some people try to pull out like this big because they don't know the word but Dundee said that's not a knife this is a knife right <laughs> now this is a knife and the guys that were fixing to put it on him they all ran down the street because he had a bigger sword so file for an extension on your sword The author of Hebrews describes the true power of God. He says it all rests in God's Word. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit. There's a discerner. Choom, cut that guy right there. Bam. We're going to see what's really inside of you through the Word. Truth is going to come forth. Number one, it's going to cut away all the garbage. You're going to see the truth. And let me tell you something. He humbled himself. Not under me, under the Word, the power of God. But guess what? He didn't, he didn't receive it. But you know what? It's a witness against him in the end. If he doesn't accept it. 
piercing even the division of the soul and the joints of the marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. Here's the true power. It's the Word of God that's able to discern your very heart. Man, if you... God knows how you get your information. What is it? Information for you? Just to be able to learn some stuff? So that you know more? Or, or you're a student of God's Word, which will be to the end, so that we can set people free. That's what you're supposed to do. This church will always be based on the Word of God, period. The end. And I'll push it to the end till I die. This is more, this is what makes you effective in the kingdom of God. You want to, you know, man, when you present the word of God like someone has never heard it before, it, it, it grabs them. It grabs them. It's not the same old Sunday after Sunday, and I'm not putting it down, but it's time the preachers and the ministers, you know, begin to study to show their self-approved unto God. So that people who are abounded in chains, who have questions, need answers. They need to have an answer so that maybe they could be set free by the power of God. Because the Word says that when they hear the truth, they will know it. That guy and those men that were in there heard the truth. There was no getting around it. Some of them was in tears, crying, while the other ones are... Li listen to me, literally and physically. I'm like, hey, Jason's like, get from behind me. Get away from the bookshelf. What are you doing? Your mind don't stop. That's what he said. Your mind don't stop. And these two guys right here are crying. One guy said, pray for me. I go before the judge tomorrow. If I get out, I will be in church at your church Saturday morning. <laughs> don't waste your life. Learn the word. Why? That's your job. It's our job. We're ministers. What's more important? There is nothing more important than that. So that you can go and set others free. Because you're going to stand before God. I'm saved. What was really in your heart? Just to be saved? If, is that what it is? Because you just don't want to burn? Well, you're in trouble. You're already in danger of hellfire because God didn't call you for that. Because if you don't produce fruit, you will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Tough message. But it ends amazing. Watch. People don't want to hear sound doctrine anymore. Don't tell me these things. Why? Because the word brings conviction because it, 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 it judges you right where you're at. Son, what's in your hand? Put it down. Are you listening? Your life depends on it. The author of Hebrews describes the true power of God. He says it rests in God's Word. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Number two, the second prerequisite. So number one, remember number one, the first was to have your heart soul holy upon the Lord. Number one, David Wilkerson said. Number two, the second prerequisite is a desire to obey Him in every area. Wow! I've been going through it, son. Big time. But man, God is always faithful. Watch what he says. The Ethiopian statesman 
uh, statesman is a clear example of this. He has a desire to obey. He was still blind to spiritual things because he didn't yet have a revelation of Jesus, but his uh, later actions prove that he had a heart set on full obedience to God. That's where we need to be. We say, oh, let, show us, Lord, and tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. Man, we say it. Watch what he says. And as God, it says, um, his actions prove it as his heart was set full on obedience to God. As God searched the earth for a heart that was open to him, his eyes fell upon this lone figure and the guise of desert. God sees this man in his word. So now God wants to send somebody to him. Wow. Because he's searching. And, uh, and, when he was, uh, and when he saw this man diligently studying the scriptures, hungry to know God and prepared to obey his word, how quickly the Lord responded. Suddenly, we're told, an angel appeared to Philip in Jerusalem, instructing him to leave the revival in Samaria and go into the desert. Lord, why do you want me to leave here and move there? Oh, you're going to be obedient. Run. Lord, you want me to run around the church? Run. Lord, do you want me to get somebody else too? I'm running. Being obedient to the little things. Remember the dreams? Being obedient to the little things that He tells you to do will eventually bring you to another place. That's probably even more frightful. <laughs> oh, more trust. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So number one, he's obedient. So Philip set out for Gaza Desert. I'm, oh, you want me to leave the revival? Everybody's getting saved. But there's a man in the desert who's seeking me. Wow. So Philip set out to the guise of desert, and when the chariot came, uh, came by, the Holy Spirit told him, get into the chariot, the Holy Ghost. And Philip, he introduced. Uh, so Philip climbed in, and immediately he asked the Ethiopian, do you understand what you're reading? And the statesman answered, how can I understand unless somebody shows me the meaning? Oh, I can show you, Philip answered. Wow. You got to be able to show them. He, you got to be able to show them. Right? Then he began preaching Christ under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Ooh, he began to preach Jesus Christ. It, it only started there. In Gaza. We don't know how far it went. But he began to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Probably... All the way to Ethiopia. Now I know in Gaza, where Gaza is and where they were headed, there's a long ways away before they come to maybe the Gulf of Agaba or the Red Sea or whatever it is. So I don't know where, how far he got. But I can imagine that Ethiopian didn't want him to go nowhere because under the power of the Holy Spirit, you could sit here for six hours. And your glutamus maximus won't even say anything to you. Because you're feeding. Right? And watch what he says. He says, in a statement answered, How can I understand unless somebody shows me the meaning? Oh, I can show you, Philip answered. Then he began preaching Christ under the oak unction of the Holy Spirit. He told the statement that Jesus was the Lamb. What? If he told him he was the Lamb, he had to take him back to Genesis where the first Lamb was killed. Man, that Christ was crucified, buried, and rose again. And all that confess and believe in him and are baptized will be saved from their sin and given everlasting life. The statesman replied, the Ethiopian, you're telling me Jesus is the lamb? And if I believe in him and obey him and I'm baptized, I'll be saved? Then I must be baptized. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Dead man. How many people say that? How many people you pre preach the conviction power of the Holy Spirit to? And you say you got to repent and be baptized. 
so that you could be saved. Repent, be baptized for remission of sins, every one of you, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll receive eternal life. I want it. Give it to me. When can you baptize me? That's true conviction. Yeah. No, it ain't like that now. No fear of God. The statesman replied, So Jesus is the Lamb. Look, there's a pond. What hinders me from obeying His word right now? Right now. What, what hindering me from obeying His word right now? Nothing. Nothing. There is water. He says, The Ethiopian is a rich dude. A rich guy carrying treasures I'm sure to bring to the temple still loaded down Phillips translated before he can even make an I'm sure the Ethiopian was like ready hey Philip man amazing here take all of it take this take some of it at least uh -uh, it's free he didn't even get to that point BAM <laughs> I mean koosh baptized boom he's gone what? And he went on rejoicing, right? He says, uh, The Ethiopian was saying, in essence, Brother Philip, show me anything that hinders me from obeying God. Expose anything and everything. I want freedom from my sin in every bondage. I want all that the Lord has for me. I want nothing to hold me back from doing what God has commanded me. Beloved, this is exactly the prerequisite God is looking for. I told them guys last night, you don't have to walk down here or stand up in this place, in this prison, and repeat after me. You don't have, I, I don't need to see it. You don't need to do that, but if you want me to, I will. But if you truly want Jesus Christ, you go back to your zone. You get in the bed, pull the covers over the top of your head, and you confess your sins. You get with Him and say, I don't need a number. I don't need, I went in there and some brothers said, how many people have you gotten saved since you've been coming to the prison? Pulls out a piece of paper. Look how many I've led to the Lord. A hundred and something of them. Oh, that's real nice. How many were real convictions? Conversions. Oh, it's about numbers for you. The heart, man. See it. I, I, you I nothing. I, I should be followed by am nothing. Yeah. But he is everything. Amen. And if they come, it wasn't by you, it's because God drew them. Right. And if they've come in, you ain't doing nothing but harvesting something somebody's already sowed and others have watered. So why are you glorying in what you said you brought? Yeah. Wow! One plant, one waters. But if God doesn't blow on it, baby, it doesn't grow. So who is it that plants or who is it that waters, Paul said? Nothing. Nobody. But God that gives the increase. Wow. You meet all kind, believe me. So, Lord, where was I at? Um... And the Ethiopian was saying, in essence, okay, I read that. Um, he says, um, the Ethiopian was saying, in essence, and I'm almost done. Brother Philip, show me anything that hinders me from obeying God. Expose every, anything and everything. I want freedom from my sin and bondage. I want all that the Lord has for me. I want nothing that holds me back from doing what he commands. Beloved, this is exactly the prerequisite God is looking for. It's what qualifies us for the release of the Holy Ghost power. Wow. When you're really hungry for Him and you want Him, the Holy Spirit will give you revelation power. Because He knows what it is you really want. That's where that power is released. So that you can manifest Christ. The guy in the dreams like, don't do what you normally do. Okay, you don't want me to preach the gospel and him crucified, but they want the regular stuff. Watch how crazy this is. 
There is no putting off obedience. There's no waiting for a better time. No half-hearted commitment. This kind of attitude is summed up in the words of the Ethiopian. Lord, I want to obey you now. I want freedom to enjoy your victory now. I want to go through, I don't want to go through another day bound by sin. Remove hindrances, Lord. I want to walk in your resurrection power. The third prerequisite hmm, is a stepping out in faith. Wow. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and baptized him. Philip gladly complied with the Ethiopian's request. The Ethiopian requested it. Hey, pastor, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I watched this man break down in church and wanted to be saved. Bam! I didn't even do nothing. Spirit hit him. Bam! I have to tell you about that. I'll get him to tell you what happened. After, anyway. Whew. Yet, as soon as the two men came out of the water, Philip suddenly vanished. The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. As you read this, maybe you'll want you, uh, as you read this, you may wonder, wait a minute, they're in a the desert. There's no one in the sight besides these two men. But when they walk out of the pond, suddenly one of them disappears? Hmm. And yet all scripture has, uh, and all the scripture has to say about this is the Ethiopian went his way. Two points are being made in this passage. First, God wants us to keep our eyes on the main figure. The Ethiopian, after all, this story is about the work of the Holy Spirit in that hungry seeking man. And second, God wants to show us how miraculous uh, he releases his spirit's power when he finds that kind of heart. God is looking for someone he can do that to. The majority of the ones that are out there, is, they're not looking for him. They're not seeking for him. He was seeking the kingdom of God. And it was revealed. The Holy Spirit knows your heart. He knows you want to be delivered and obey Him in all things. If you simply believe Him for direction and faithfully act on His instructions, one day at that time, he, one day at a time, He will continue to lead you. I can assure you on the authority of the Scriptures, if you set your heart to search and study God's Word, and if you're ready to obey His every commandment, the moment it comes, His Spirit will give you clear direction for life. Watch this. Then, when the enemy's arm comes at you like a flood, when it appears you'll be swept away by demonic powers, you can trust that God will tell you exactly what to do. He knows every step ahead of you, and He will not let you down. Wow. Now when I tell you, the Holy Ghost is ready to talk to you in His still, small voice. You don't have to live in depression any longer. You don't have to run from revival to revival looking for deliverances and crying out for the same tears years after years. The Holy Ghost has a word for you. And you don't need a pastor a counselor, a teacher, a psychologist to deliver, you, to deliver it to you. You only need the Holy Spirit. He doesn't listen. Watch this. Guys, this is the last little thing right here at the bottom. To show you how amazing God is. Wednesday night, I, uh, I told y'all the dreams and how the Lord spoke to me. I heard a voice behind me, the jewelry box, had a verse, voice behind me, you know, uh, telling me this or telling me that. Listen to what he says. He doesn't give you instructions for tomorrow, but just for today. And if you obey his word today, he'll speak to you again tomorrow. Wow. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying this is the way walk in it 
whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left hand. I told you guys how amazing is God with his timing that Wednesday night I told you how God spoke. This is the way, that's the way. He spoke from a voice behind me. It's Isaiah chapter 30. I open up David Wilkerson's letter, being led by the Spirit, being led by God. It's all about the Word of God and what's powerful and what changes people's lives. Right? To be able to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I told you how I heard the Lord, how He spoke to me. This is not about me. But here it is. I open a letter up in the last verse in it. The last paragraph. He doesn't give you instructions for, for tomorrow, but just for today. And this is what I wanted to tell you. I know a lot of you that are sitting here are wondering about where God has you. It's where He has you. It's where He has you. God spoke to it. You need to believe it. And you need to walk it out. Just like for me, when God spoke to me on the way down from Tennessee, said it was time to go and come here. But yet, it requires faith every day that God is going to provide. And He only will speak when He speaks to you. I told you that. God will speak to you. But if you don't do what it is He told you to do, well then, you're not going any further. You're stuck. The sword is the word that's been delivered to you. This is what's quick and powerful. This is what you need to believe. You've been brought here for a reason so that God can show you, reveal to you, and all of these things, and you need to trust Him. You need to trust Him. This goes back to having the key. God gave me the key because I went after Him with my whole heart. And I stand here today in front of my family, my daughter, and others. When I came to the Lord, and this is nothing to be bound. This is nothing for you. This is something that God had done in me every day, countless hours, because He had placed a hunger in me that was so great, I couldn't get enough of Him. Ten hours, twelve hours a day at this particular time in my life, and because the hunger was there, the Holy Spirit started dropping the power, revealing the power that's now the sword. This is a confirmation to me that Luke walked in and gave me. That God had told me and showed me. My brother asked me, and he's got it, brother, take this. Because you need a sword. You need this for others so that you can set others free cut the yoke of bondage from off of them that's why I told Chris Chris here's my card call me because the, the chains that's got him bounded well remember what I told you the key that was the whole deal I even mentioned keys Wednesday Remember, I pulled that the second dream was a key that unlocks, takes the chains off, sets them free, is the Word. The key is the knowledge and the understanding of the Word. Hopefully, I can cut the chains that's holding Chris bounded by revealing and proving to him that Jesus is God. Amen. And the one that you're serving now is not God. How can I do that? It's very simple. Hey, Chris, if you see this, Abraham and Isaac, Abraham begat Isaac and Ishmael. Through Isaac, the nations would be blessed and be saved. Not through Ishmael. Through Ishmael, the, through Hagar, Abraham had a bond, sir, had a servant who was an Ethiopian, which goes back to Ham, who gave birth Ishmael, who was of the flesh, a wild man. It was through Isaac. 
And as when you can begin to talk to people, because you've studied the Word, you might not have all the answers. But you need to study to show yourself approved unto God because, man, listen, this is not the field. This is the training ground for the field. Right. Now when you walk out the door, do what you've been taught. Right. Amen. Do it. But that's not what the most of them are coming to the church for. They're not coming so that they can learn. When I was a, a police officer, I had to go to school to learn how to handle what to do. All, so that when I got in a unit, I could put it into practice. That's the problem. Ever learning. And don't do anything when they walk out the doors. But every time they come in church, they want more equipment. They want more. Give me more. Give me more. You got a whole shed full. What are you doing with it? And I am excited when you come to that point. Because what you're going to do is you're going to go out and produce more. And that's what I'm supposed to help you do. You grow. You leave the house. You go produce a family and kids. You train them, they go produce family and kids. Multiply. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You should be leaving with the message that you receive here that's so powerful. Telling others out there, you got to hear this kind of stuff. It's mind-blowing. Excited that they want to come. And if they come and they want to leave, well, that's up to them. Man, you got to realize what the church is for. It's not, oh, we saved and they all damned to hell. No. We're all workers, laborers. Anybody that goes on a job and doesn't work, he ain't going to be there long. Right? So... He doesn't give instructions for tomorrow, but just for today. You want to know if you're in the right place? You're in the right place. You're in the right place. You need to believe it and walk in it and surrender to it and go forward so that God can finish the work that He's begun in you so you can go on to your next project. <laughs> right? And if you obey his word today, he'll speak to you again tomorrow. Your ears shall hear the word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left, Isaiah 30, 21. Get ready, people. Get ready to hear the voice of God's Spirit speaking your word of deliverance. Rest. I want you to read Isaiah chapter 30. That's your homework. Read Isaiah chapter 30. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, thank you, Lord, for just, um, Lord, for your blessings. Lord, thank you for meeting the need. Lord, help us. Father, give us a heart, Lord. Eyes to see, ears to hear. A heart to receive. And then a will, Father, to do it. To do your will, Father. To seek first your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.